uh, uh, finance, uh, financing uh, terrorism action plan, both action plans were not only completed, but completed ahead of time. We are the only country to have ever simultaneously completed two action plans. We are not only incredibly proud of our achievement, but we'd like the opportunity to share our experiences uh, with the rest of the world. Having completed our joint action plans, now Pakistan aspires to be a member of the FATF because we believe, having gone through this experience, we now uh, have the ability, the skills, the infrastructure in place, not only to tackle these issues domestically, but share our experiences with other countries. Another point I want to emphasize within the context of terrorism, of counterterrorism, that this is a cause that is incredibly personal to me. I have lost my mother, Shahid Motarma Benazir Bhutto, the first uh, female prime minister of the Muslim world, to the scourge of terrorism. She returned to Pakistan in 2007 to challenge terrorists at a time when it wasn't particularly popular to do so in Pakistan. She did so at a time when the vast majority of male political leaders within Pakistan did not have the courage to condemn terrorism, to publicly campaign against terrorism. She has survived uh, what to this date is the uh, largest terrorist attack in Pakistan in, 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 in so far as the sheer number of victims, the October 18th, 2007 terrorist attack in Karachi, but she never gave up, nor was she deterred. And her bravery, her courage, her determination mirrors the bravery, the courage, the determination, the sacrifice of the people of Pakistan. As a Muslim, as a Pakistani, as a victim of terrorism, I believe it is time that we move away from some of the Islamophobic uh, narrative framing of this issue that took place after the awful attacks of September um, 11th, 2001. Because what we have witnessed from that date up until now is that terrorism, of course, knows no religion, knows no boundaries. It is important for us to cons consistently emphasize, and I, I remember still growing up and hearing uh, quotes from world leaders such as, not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. And unfortunately, I find myself, we find ourselves in an incredibly odd situation where me as a Pakistani, as a Muslim, as a victim of terror, I am not defined. My country is not defined. My people are not defined by the brave bravery of Shaheed Mautama Ben Azir Bhutto and the thousands of other Pakistanis that have stood up and given their lives to these terrorists. These terrorists. We are defined by those who carry out these acts just because they call themselves Muslims. Till this day, yesterday, I, when I was contributing at the ministerial meeting uh, sorry, at the UN Security Council on the, on, on the reform of multilateralism. Uh, and I requested the UN Security Council 
that the issue of Kashmir is an issue that should be solved through multilateralism, through uh, the United Nations Security Council. In response to that, I was told that because Osama bin Laden was found in Pakistan, I said, Shit, sit down and shut up. The fact of the matter is, Osama bin Laden is dead. He was never a Pakistani. And he does not define the people of Pakistan. He does not define the Muslim world. It is Shaheed Mothrama Benazir Bhutto and countless other leaders and people across the Muslim world who have stood up to these terrorists. If you look at the data, more Muslims have been killed in terrorist attacks from 2001 up until 2022, just in sheer quantum of victims. So we demand to be recognized as the victims, not the perpetrators of terror. For us to all to own the principle, which I believe was also in some of the language put out today from the UN Security Council, that terrorism truly has no race, has no religion. And whether a terrorist shoots up school children here in the United States, conducts a suicide attack in Pakistan, attacks anybody, any institution in my neighborhood, in India, terrorists are terrorists. And we must all work together as an international community instead of victim blaming the Muslim world, the Muslim community, we must work with them. Before I arrived here in the United States, uh, at the United Nations, the Interior Ministry of Pakistan shared a dossier about the 2021, yes, terrorist attack in Johar town of Lahore. Our law enforcement agencies have conducted a thorough investigation. And in addition to those who perpetrated the attack, we believe that those who backed the attack, those that financed the attack, those that orchestrated the attack are still at large. These um, facilitators, finances, perpetrators uh, belong to my neighboring country of India. This dossier has been shared with members of the General Assembly and the Security Council, or just the Security Council, the members of the Security Council. I urge the international community to help Pakistan in combating, because we can go after the people within our own territory who perpetuate the attack, but it's incredibly difficult to go after those that back, that support, that finance, that facilitate such, attack, such attacks without the support of the international community. In particular, we have requested for the listing of four or five individuals, four or five, four, four individuals uh, it, who are associated with this attack. Unfortunately, our neighboring country has thus far been successful in thwarting our attempts at listing these individuals. We believe that the various shades, various groups that conduct terrorist activities within Pakistan, unfortunately, uh, a significant portion of these groups are facilitated, financed, backed, and supported by a country in our neighborhood. 
particularly the terrorist organizations that target Pakistan's economic engagement with India, uh, with China, in the form of the One Belt, One Road initiatives. Everything from the attack on the Chinese consulate in Karachi to various attacks in Balochistan have been traced back to such groups. The former Indian Prime Minister, Mr. Vajpayee, at Sharm el Sheikh, admitted to India's involvement supporting such groups within the context of Balochistan. The former National Security Advisor is on the record. President. Sorry? President. So, thank you. Correction. Uh, the President National Security Advisor is on the record as far as their support uh, for, for such groups uh, conducting attacks within Pakistan. I call upon the Indian government that these tactics must end. You cannot imagine that you will finance, that you will foster, that you will encourage such terrorist activities in my country, and then that these terrorists will be content with only conducting terrorist activities within my country. And it is about time that India and Pakistan and the international community work together to ensure that so-called non-state actors, wherever they are, wherever they conduct their uh, nefarious activities from, wherever they target, whether they target Pakistan, whether they target any other country, that we work together to ensure that the financing, support, and facilitation of these groups come to an end. It is important for us, given the incredibly difficult and testing times that we face, that we finally once and for all, work together to put an end to this long-standing point of irritation between our two countries. I believe that we have to draw a line in the sand and say that we have a complicated history, complicated past, around this topic. Let's look to the future and ensure that going forward, no Pakistani will have to fear for their life, worry about whether their kids will come home or not. Um, heaven forbid if there's a terrorist attack. And that no Indian should have to worry that their family, their kids won't be able to come home as a result of some terrorist attack. I thank you all for your time. I thank you, Foreign Minister of Pakistan. Uh, we will open the floor for questions. Before I open the floor, I would request to raise one question at a time so that we can give uh, time to other participants. Uh, we, if we will be left with some time, we will take follow-up questions. So let's start with Valeria. Our thank you, thank you, Mariam. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Foreign Minister, on behalf of uh, the United Nations Correspondent Association for this uh, press conference, uh, Valeria Robecco from ANSA News Agency. So, in your opinion, does the recent international events uh, reinforce the need for a review of some uh, functioning mechanism of the UN, including the Security, the reform of the Security Council, and what kind of feedback uh, have you received uh, in response uh, to the Uniting for Consensus Group's effort in this regard, in this direction? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think as far as reform for the, at the United Nations is concerned, Pakistan has been clear and consistent since 1995. Since 1995, we've been supporting and working with the UFC group uh, in hoping uh, that that is the direction that reform at the United Nations will uh, take place. Obviously, others have a different view. Um, I strongly and fundamentally believe uh, in multilateralism in the United Nations. I think the best of humanity can be achieved uh, when we're working together. But I also uh, believe that any reform of the United Nations must be a de democratization uh, of the United Nations. It has to fundamentally, uh, we have to sort of uh, demonstrate uh, the equality between states. 
not accentuate the inequality between, between states. I don't believe that an expansion of, um, of permanent members, uh, I don't believe that more people being able to wield the veto is the solution to our problems. We have seen, be it um, Iraq, be it uh, Ukraine, be it you know, various issues at the uh, United Nations Security Council. It is the permanent members, their outside influence, their ability to veto, that has hampered uh, the smooth functioning, if it were, of the United Nations. And this is what we believe is the problem, and certainly not the solution. Thank you, Miriam. Ambassador, Foreign Minister, it's Pamela Falk from CBS News. Nice to see you again. Uh, the UN funding for the pack for the floods yeah. is very low. It's yeah. about I mean, somewhere around 30 yeah. percent and um, may run out. Mm -hmm. And in an interview in the last day, you said uh, Pakistan also has energy insecurity, is not taking um, reduced rates from Russia. Um, how can you bridge the gap if the UN isn't coming through and other subsidies are not coming through? So thank me, you. Thank you so much. Let me, let me break it down in, uh, for you as far as the floods are concerned. This is, um, I mean, the shift scale. Uh, I was here now two months ago, uh, and I'm back again. At that time, a third of the country was underwater, but today, still parts of my country are underwater. Parts of Sindh, parts of Balochistan are still underwater. They've missed not just the one crop that they lost last time, but this time around, also the wheat crop. So economically for them, this is absolutely devastating. From the areas where the water has receded, there's devastation left in their way. We have um, the health crisis that, that, uh, that I was talking about last time uh, has manifested in various ways. But for example, our malaria season is uh, going on um, for an extended period uh, because waterborne diseases are still uh, spreading as a result uh, uh, of, the, uh, 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 of, of the water still being there. Uh, we have uh, an education crisis just in my home province of Sindh. It's one of the four provinces of Pakistan, but it's the most devastated uh, from the floods. 47% of my province's school infrastructure, educational infrastructure, is either part partly or completely damaged from the floods. And my province's 52% of my province's school-going children who used to go to school, and those 47% of the school buildings cannot go to school. So there's a climate emergency, there's a health emergency, there's an education emergency. It is an absolutely uh, monumentous, uh, monumental task. As far as the relief efforts go, along with the United Nations and the, uh, and the international community, we're doing the best we can and to provide relief for the people. Uh, within Pakistan, through the Benazir Income Support Program, we've su su provided cash transfers, particularly to women uh, who have been affected. Uh, through USAID and the United Nations, other forms of support uh, is getting through. But the scale is so large that no matter what we do, uh, we feel that more needs to be done. But that's the relief aspect, uh, which is, uh, has been ongoing, and now we'll need to continue to uh, progress through the winter months with its unique challenges, then we have to look towards the reconstruction and the rehabilitation. Uh, and we would like to um, do so, reconstruct, rehabilitate, invest in this infrastructure, but do so in a greener, more climate resilient manner. We're incredibly grateful to the Secretary General of the United Nations, who will be co-hosting a conference for climate resistant Pakistan on January 9th in Geneva, uh, where we will kick off uh, this initiative. It'll be the start, not the end, of our, uh, our, 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 our ambition uh, to rebuild a, a climate-resilient Pakistan. The scale of the damages, to summarize for you finally, uh, has been estimated at $30 billion, about 10% of our GDP. Uh, a conservative estimate is $16 billion are necessary for the reconstruction and rehabilitation. I'm under no delusion that we'll be able to gather this money through one conference or at, in, in, in one day, or through one event. This is going to be an ongoing process uh, that we kick off with the UN Secretary uh, General uh, in early January. And on the energy? So on energy, uh, so as part of a flood reconstruction mm -hmm. rehabilitation, we are looking to, um, for, for a catalyst for, for, it to, 
play as a catalyst for our green energy transition. Uh, and hopefully not only with the international community, but also with the public sector, uh, uh, private public, private partnerships, sorry, private sector, uh, to work on green energy, on solar energy, on wind energy within Pakistan. Overall, we do have uh, energy insecurity and an energy uh, problem. We import far too many hydrocarbons. Uh, that, that, that bill uh, for Pakistan and for the people of the Pakistan is too uh, expensive to afford. Uh, it is something that is, in, it is getting increasingly expensive and, uh, after the fallout of uh, COVID and supply chains issues and then now the Ukraine uh, crisis is, has absolutely exacerbated uh, that problem. We are committed to not only our transition to green energy, we want to focus more on uh, domestically produced energy rather than uh, imported uh, high hydrocarbons, but in the crisis of now, uh, we will do whatever we can uh, to meet our people's needs. James? James Bates <clears throat> from Al Jazeera. Um, can I ask you about Afghanistan? Uh, um, we are seeing harsher and harsher punishments from the Taliban. We're seeing women excluded from public life, girls have not been allowed to go back to school, and in recent days, we've seen clashes taking place across one of the two main border points between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Is it time for Pakistan to reconsider its policy of engagement with the Taliban? Do you need to look at this again? Um, okay, so as far as engagement is concerned, I believe not only Pakistan, but the international community must engage. I can't wish the Taliban away or Afghanistan away. They're a reality that they're on my, are on my uh, border. The modes and ways that uh, we are engaging, the ways in which we are engaging, particularly within the Pakistani context and as far as the TTP, perhaps that can be reconsidered as far as strategy is concerned, as far as uh, the way we put, uh, put across our demands or what we expect from them. But we can't give up on engaging. I don't believe if I just turn my backs and you know stop talking and the rest of the world stop, stop talking that Afghanistan's issues will sort out uh, themselves. So I how do you make the Taliban change its behavior? <laughs> well, um, I, I remember, first of all, our interview the last time I was here, it went very well. I think in that I, I tried to argue uh, that we've got a sort of chicken and egg situation. Um, the economic situation in Afghanistan is dire. The humanitarian situation is incredibly alarming. It's this organization, it's the United Nations, that has said that 97% of their people will fall below the poverty line. I hear, I know of horrific, horrific stories. You hear of child marriages. No, they're not marrying off their young girls out of choice or because they want to. It's because they physically can't afford to feed their children. And they think it's better to have a child marriage so that someone can take care of their little girls. I've heard horrible stories about how parents are drugging their children to sleep because they have to go to sleep hungry. I want women's rights more than anyone. I believe that within the Islamic world, it is our religion that before many other religions granted rights to women. It is my country that produced the first Muslim female prime minister. We will not compromise on women's rights. But I want to also be practical, uh, practical about how we can achieve that. I do not believe we can starve the Afghans to force them to follow women's empowerment or to live around these provinces. I believe that there needs to be not only humanitarian assistance, but the conducive economic environment to allow those who do want to deliver on their provinces to themselves and on the international community vis-a-vis -vis, uh, women's rights, the political space to do so. I think history has demonstrated that whenever in the past, in autocratic, theocratic uh, regimes, when the economic times are tough, then uh, right, rights are usurped, contracted, rather than expanded. I don't believe that with the Afghans' money frozen, with their banking channels shut, we will see progress on this and other issues. In my conversations, well, not my conversations, but conversations that happen um, with the government of the interim government of Afghanistan or their representatives, we do emphasize on the need for them to deliver, or not my promise or your promise, on their promise to the international community, which includes inclusiveness, rights to women and girls, particularly 
in the education context, uh, ensuring that their, land, their, their, their country, their soil is not used uh, to perpetuate terrorism. I believe that we can achieve those goals through engagement. It's been one year since they've taken over Afghanistan. I'm sure that one year is an incredibly long time for the women of Afghanistan, for the girls of Afghanistan, but it is still one year. I'm hopeful that with further engagement uh, with not only ourselves, but working with the international community, through the OIC and other organizations, that we hopefully will be able uh, to convince them to implement their own promises. Mr. Azimian. Mr. Foreign Minister Azimian from Geo TV Geo and Jan Group. Uh, the, a war of words is going on between the Indian Foreign Minister and the Pakistani Foreign Minister. Just a few minutes back, Indian Foreign Minister accused Pakistan of terrorism, and Pakistan has been submitting so many dossiers to different authorities, different organizations, including the UN, but with no result so far. So how long the Kabul, Delhi, and Islamabad are going to face this war of terrorism against each other? And secondly, do you foresee any kind of rise in tensions because Pakistan is in a vulnerable situation and there is a war of words between you and the Indian Foreign Minister over here? Will it turn into any kind of rise in the tensions along the borders? I don't believe we're in a war of words. Are we in a war of words? I haven't noticed. I want to be very careful because I actually didn't catch uh, the statement that you're referring to. Just uh, now, he, he made that by stakeout. Oh, okay, well, that I disagree. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty safe to say. Look, I'm the foreign minister of Pakistan. And Pakistan's foreign minister is a victim of terrorism, is the son of Shahid Mohtamab Benazir Bhutto. The prime minister of Pakistan, Shabazz Sharif, when he was CM of Punjab, his home uh, minister uh, was assassinated by terrorists. Political parties, civil society, the average people in Pakistan, across the board, have been the victims or the perpetrators of terrorists. We've lost far more lives to terrorism than India has. Why, why, why would we want our own people to suffer? We absolutely do not. Unfortunately, I think India has been playing in that space that I referred to earlier in my statement. Where it's very easy to say Muslim and terrorists together and get the world to agree. And they very skillfully blur this line where people like myself are associated with terrorists rather than as those who are, have been fighting and to this day are fighting terrorism. Um, as far as India is concerned, they've had terrorist attacks. They too should not have had to experience terrorist attacks, whatever cooperation they need, we've pr uh, uh, offered in the past, we can, you know, uh, would like to uh, continue to offer in the future. But they continuously perpetuate this philosophy. And it's not just for Pakistan, it's for the Muslims in India. We're terrorists whether we're Muslims in Pakistan, and we're terrorists whether we're Muslims in India. I'd like to remind the Honorable Foreign Minister of Eternal, or the Minister for External Affairs of India, that Osama bin Laden is dead, but the butcher of Gujarat lives, and he is the Prime Minister of India. He was banned from entering this country until he became Prime Minister. This is the Prime Minister of the RSS and the Foreign Minister of the RSS. What is the RSS? The RSS draws its inspiration from Hitler's SS. The RSS, I saw yesterday that the Foreign Minister of India was with the UN Secu uh, Secretary General inaugurating uh, uh, um, a, a statue of Gandhi. But if the Foreign Minister of India was being honest, then he knows as well as I that the RSS does not believe in Gandhi, in the ideology of Gandhi, in the manifestation of in the manifesto of Gandhi, they do not see this individual as the founder of India. They hero worship the terrorist that assassinated Gandhi. 
within India. Who perpetuates terrorism? Is it Pakistan? Ask the people of Gujarat. They will say it's their prime minister. Ask the people of Kashmir. They will say the butcher of Gujarat is now the butcher of Kashmir. And I'm not talking about some imaginary past. I'm talking about today. They're not even attempting to wash the blood of people of Gujarat off their hands for their own election campaigns. They have pardoned. Prime Minister Modi and his government have used their authority to pardon. To pardon the men who perpetuated rape against Muslims in Gujarat. Who conducted the gang rape of women in Gujarat. Those rapists, those terrorists were freed, were pardoned for the Prime Minister of India. This is the truth of the matter. So in order for them to perpetuate their politics of hate, their Hindu supremacist transition from a secular India to the Hindu supremacist India, this narrative is very important for them. It's very important for them domestically, and it's very important for them internationally. They demonize the people of Pakistan. They expect the world to believe that we are all terrorists. I know we are not. And I have presented this dossier. dossier. I'm not talking about whenever well back the truth was. I'm talking about 2021. Well, we have proof that your government facilitated a terrorist attack in Pakistan. So I don't see how Pakistan is the epicenter of terrorism. I do believe that we are the victims of terrorism. If it's not the government of India, certainly the people of India have been victims of terrorism. The people of Afghanistan have been victims of terrorism. The people of the United States, the people of Europe have been the victims of terrorism. And it's for us to work together to combat the politics of hate, to combat whether it's Islamic extremism or Hindu extremism, to come together and face these challenges and not pursue narrow populism, religious populism, divisive politics domestically or internationally, and to further spread hate within communities. Otherwise, it's not just this generation, all the generations to come will continue in this cycle that we see ourselves. The second part of Abdul question. Hamid Is Sian, uh, we will take follow-up questions later, Azim, yes, sir. Thank uh, you. Mr. Sian. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Foreign Minister. Thank you, uh, Mariam, and thank you, Ambassador Munir. My name is Abdul Hamid Sayan uh, from the Arabic Daily Al Quds Al Arabi. I have many questions, but Mariam ordered us to confine our. I am, sir. I cannot. <laughs> and my question about internal issues in sure. Pakistan. Sure. Recently, there was an attempt to murder Imran Khan. Mm -hmm. It seems that he is still popular. There are many people supporting him. When he calls for a rally, he receives hundreds of thousands of people. So how do you explain what happened? Who was behind it? What does the investigation say yes, about the attack? I think there's, there's, there's two parts of your investigation. As far as the, the attack uh, on uh, Mr. Khan is concerned, uh, I would like to once again emphasize uh, to the Punjab government in uh, Pakistan that it's incredibly important. Uh, this is not just an attack on Mr. Imran Khan. This is an attack on a former prime minister. It's not about political differences. We want to see the facts. Uh, and there's an investigation on the provincial level ongoing that needs to uh, show results. On the federal level, the Prime Minister has written uh, to our superior judiciary to investigate the matter. As far as Mr. Khan's popularity, that's where I'll contest you. Because um, we all saw him and his march in, in Pindi. Hundreds of thousands of people did not gather. A few thousand people gathered. In a country with 200 million people, uh, I believe that any one of our political parties can organize uh, a political function on the scale that Mr. Khan has. Uh, a popular leader was Shaheed Mohtarma Benazir Bhutto, who landed in Pakistan in 1986 and still holds the record to this day of the largest political gathering with three million people. I received her at the airport. Our population today is far beyond that. 
Um, Mr. Khan uh, ha is particularly well versed, as most populists are, uh, with social media. He uses that as a propaganda tool. Uh, and th there were some by elections held recently in Pakistan, about nine by elections. And these by elections were the seats that Mr. Khan, as parliamentarians, um, resigned from the assembly. So in those seats, there were by elections. And in those by elections, Mr. Khan lost three of the seats he once held uh, and won the rest. If I was in that situation uh, where my party had had 10 by elections and nine by elections uh, in seats that are our seats and I lost three of them, then uh, I would be you know, quite worried about my prospects in the general elections. Ibtisam. Uh, thank you, Maryam. Uh, hi, my name is Ibtisam Azim from Al Arabi Al Jadid newspaper. I have uh, first a very quick follow up on James' question on Afghanistan and economics. Sure. Uh, could you please elaborate a little bit more what do you believe that needs to be done? You, you touched a little bit upon the issue of frozen assets. So, yeah. so one, one frozen assets, but also the banking channels are shut. So there, 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 there's economic activity or their projects um, that were sort of pending from the old administration and all of a sudden they can't function because people's bank accounts uh, don't work. I believe such act, th this is sort of unnecessarily cruel. Uh, if these economic activities were to take place, they provide job opportunities to the people of Afghanistan that would benefit not only the men but the women of Afghanistan as well. So I think it's incredibly important uh, for us to at least on that front uh, facilitate the functioning of their economy uh, so that there can be some activity for them to withstand the shocks uh, that we're all facing, you know, difficult economic times everywhere. And when talking with the, the Americans or other um, leaders, which, what do you hear on response on that issue? I get it. It's difficult, uh, particularly in Western countries, particularly in uh, D.C. or in, you know, Westminster, to, um, to convince your parliaments to continue, uh, from, whether it's to continue humanitarian funding or, or to in, in ensure progress on these fundamental economic points, uh, given uh, the perceptions of the Taliban and, uh, and their history, it's very difficult uh, to convince um, the, their congresses and their parliaments about this chicken and egg situation that I tried to uh, explain to Jane's uh, about what comes first. And therefore, I think those are the sort of challenges that they do face. That they, uh, this is where we're trapped. They say no. You complete your, you, you, you deliver on women's rights first before we can move anywhere. Uh, and those of us who are watching the uh, sort of situation on the ground are extremely concerned that if we don't even see this minimal progress, then women's education and an expansion of women's rights in Afghanistan will be a distant dream. Shu. Yeah. Hi, Minister. Um, this is Deutsche Shu with China Central Television Hi. here. Hi. Uh, I'm going to ask a question on, on uh, G77 and China. So uh, we know that for past decades, uh, not only developing countries, I would say the whole world benefits from globalization and the international trade and, 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 and the commercials. Uh, but recently, uh, we saw more and more hurdles on this, like particular country, they, they put uh, the countries, they put, let's say, tariffs on particular things, blocking export or flow of technology or, or the subsidizing things. Um, what would that impact the developing countries, especially in the time you said, and I quote, facing unprecedented challenges to, to their econ economic progress as well as the danger of social and political turmoil? So we did discuss this at, at, um, at the G77, and I'm sure it'll be taken up by other countries as well, absolutely. Uh, we've called for the end of this, uh, this protect protectionism that we're seeing all over the place. It's particularly funny because um, growing up, I heard a lot about how great the free market was and how everybody should follow the free market. And I think it, that worked well by those specific countries that did benefit from the free market were benefiting from the free market. So then everybody should follow the free market. As soon as uh, it seems that actually the free market doesn't work so well for us, then we're going back to these tariffs and these barriers that are particularly at, um, sort of cumbersome for developing countries. And I believe that we shouldn't uh, enter into this world of not only sort of, we, we shouldn't move towards uh, this sort of economic warfare where if I'm not happy that this, uh, that X country is doing well in a particular field, 
then I should, you know, sanction the hell out of it and try and uh, and, and, and artificially boost uh, that economic activity in, in, in my country. Ephraim. Thank you so much, Maryam. Mr. Foreign Minister, a question on Iran. Okay. Um, your country shares borders with Iran. Um, Ambassador Akram many times said you cannot afford having bad relations with Iran. Um, you uh, hoped last year, Pakistan was hoping that the JCPOA would succeed so that the tensions in the region would. But today, when you see what's happening in Pakistan, what is your uh, uh, Pakistan's main stance on what's happening? And since you said that um, Afghan women are an issue for the whole Muslim world, um, is um, the Iranian youth, um, Iranian women, the 350 who were killed, 20,000 in jail, is this an issue for the international community also, or is it an internal issue that Pakistan would want to distance itself from? What's so, as far as the protests that have been ongoing in Iran, I think that, which is obvious uh, to everyone, uh, that uh, the peaceful protests uh, are, and particularly the women who are protesting, are incredibly brave. We don't support sort of rioting or violence, but obviously peaceful protests uh, are, are not only encouraged by us, but even within uh, Iran. I think Iran's history has demonstrated that time and time again, the people of Iran have been very brave in their political activity, in their uh, activism, and in their protesting. As a result of the uh, the, 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 the protests of Iranian women, we are seeing, uh, or at least I'm hearing, about potential uh, as a result of those protests. And I believe that achievement will be an achievement uh, for the brave women of Iran who have been protesting. Um, as far as whether this is an international issue or not, I believe that when uh, not so much sort of uh, the, the, the success or ability, uh, let, let's take it out of the context of Iran. I'd feel more comfortable talking if it were in my own country. So in my own country, if I'm being challenged by protests, uh, if the, the, the more organic uh, uh, those protests seem, the more likely they are to succeed and the more legitimacy they have. Within the Iranian uh, context, I believe in some cases with some uh, Western countries um, co-opting uh, some of these protests rather than empowering sort of undermines uh, those efforts. So that is just the sort of um, the, the, the differential that I would, I, I would say that the women of Iran uh, can protest themselves, can achieve an enhancement of their rights themselves, uh, and it'll be their achievement. Uh, absolutely, women's rights, and as a topic, is something that we can discuss uh, internationally and within uh, the, the Muslim world. I believe some people um, sort of co opt these protests for their own means, which undermines uh, uh, unintentionally, perhaps, uh, their own legitimacy. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for this briefing. I have a question regarding Afghanistan. It's a follow-up. Um, your top diplomat in Afghanistan was um, uh, attacked and, and then left Afghanistan. Later, the Foreign Ministry of Pakistan announced that your top diplomat is not going to go back to Afghanistan. What that um, what that does that mean, and um, why isn't your diplomat still not in Afghanistan? Is he planning to go back to Afghanistan or not? So, the our HMO uh, head of mission in uh, in Afghanistan, uh, Nizamani Saab, uh, was attacked uh, in, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, we have security concerns. Uh, we've raised them with. Um, are, uh, with the interim government in Afghanistan. Uh, the interim government in Afghanistan has not only assured us that they will address our security concerns, uh, but they also immediately acted uh, to catch the terrorists involved in this incident. Incidents are conducting their own investigation. We too will be conducting our own investigation. I have not recalled my ambassador from Afghanistan. He was anyway planned uh, to return back to Pakistan uh, for 
our own work for our briefings and other things. Uh, and I am confident that any security concerns that we do have will be uh, addressed and in due course he will return to Afghanistan. So he is returning back to Afghanistan? I am confident that the security concerns that we have raised will be addressed and in due course he will be returning to Afghanistan. Yes. My question is, uh, since the new government uh, took over in Pakistan, have you seen any improvement in U.S.-Pakistan relations? And if you could cite some examples of that improvement. Uh, secondly, while importing oil from Russia, will you abide by the price cap? Um, as far as uh, relations, uh, foreign policy relations with the U.S. or across the board, uh, upon um, coming to office, I found, unfortunately, that Pakistan's diplomatic relations with old friends, with new friends, with, uh, with, uh, with neighbors were fraught for a whole host of reasons. We have consistently and very aggressively uh, over the past six to seven months, heightened our engagement not only with the United States but all uh, our neighbors, our partners that that we uh, that we have diplomatic relations with, uh, in, in in attempts to bridge that gap. Uh, one of the places where we've seen a significant improvement uh, would be between Pakistan U.S. relations. This is uh, reflected not only in the increased level, increased number of high level contacts, both uh, bilateral visits over here and the various delegations that have come from the United States to Pakistan. I'm particularly happy to report that an old gripe of Pakistan was and has been uh, that uh, Pakistan U.S. relations have been hyphenated. Uh, in the past, we were AFPAC or you know the various um, the various uh, forms of our uh, our our hyphenated relationship. Now, uh, after my last trip and, and interaction with Secretary Blinken, we both announced that we are officially dehyphenated, or if we are to be hyphenated, uh, then we are PAC US rather than anything else. And I think that's you know it, it might seem small, but it is a it is a long-standing ambition of ours. And let me contextualize that for you. For example, if you look at PAC US relations since. 2001, um, say 99% of it is dominated by counterterrorism, war on terrorism, extremism, extremism, extremism. Ever since I've been foreign minister, obviously we discuss uh, terrorism, but now it forms about 10% of our uh, interactions, and we discuss economic opportunities, cooperation in health, cooperation in climate. Uh, um, we've had uh, the, the, the Laura Said, the the the, the, uh, the work he works at the State Department, is in charge of business uh, on an extensive uh, tour of Pakistan, looking for. وزیر خارجہ بلاول بھٹو زرداری نیو یارک میں نیوز کانفرنس کر رہے ہیں انہوں نے کہا کہ جنیوا میں نو جنوری کو عالمی تعاون سے متعلق کانفرنس ہوئی دہشت گردی کے خلاف پاکستان کی قربانیاں کسی سے کم نہیں ہیں بلاول بھٹو زرداری کا کہنا تھا انسداد دہشت گردی کے قومی لاہ عمل کے تحت ٹھوس اقدامات کیے گئے ہیں دہشت گردوں کی مالی معاملہ روکنے کے لیے فیٹر نے ہمارے اقدامات کی توسیق کی to work in my country once here in the future. Nasser, uh, Na Nasser uh, we, can, we can take follow-up questions later and then Nasser. Uh, my name is Nasser Kayum from Gold TV Pakistan. Um, uh, Foreign Minister, my question is uh, in regards to the TPS status. Um, Pakistan has seen the worst flooding mm -hmm. in the history of Pakistan. Uh, recently, the entire country was under flood. Um, the senator from the New York uh, Jelly Band and um, Clark, Congresswoman Clark, have written the uh, letter to the U.S. administration to give the uh, status of TPS status to Pakistan, temporary protective status, which not only can help Pakistan uh, immigrants in Pakistan, but the economic crunch which Pakistan is facing, we can have a little bit of relief from uh, the temporary pro protective status. But uh, I've been asking this question from the uh, embassy in uh, our embassy in Washington DC but I'm not getting any answer uh, on the TPS status uh, can you just elaborate mr. Munir Kramir? Sure. so first of all I'm very grateful to the United States they've made a whole host of accommodations to the people of Pakistan post floods whether it's a sort of money their documents uh, actually it was reported in Voice of America I'll send you 
uh, the clip and the details later. I don't have them uh, with me. I don't remember them off the top of my head. But there's a whole host of facilities um, that are available to Pakistanis in the United States as a result of the floods. As far as the TPS status is concerned, that we haven't, uh, uh, that I haven't got any, uh, anything uh, for you on. But I will get you the details of what has been provided so far. And once I know more about TPS, I can share it. They, they just need a letter from the government of Pakistan. And uh, as I sp spoke to one of the congresswomen, they said in one week, uh, the Sure. Yeah, sure. And that, that will help greatly Pakistan. Sure. So this just just two things to emphasize. One, they've already done uh, quite a lot, so that information will get to you. On the TPS, I don't have a, a, a vision. The last vision question. For you. Um, thank you, uh, Minister, for this press conference. Stefano Vaccara, Voce di New York. My question is, we are here, the United Nations is about the charter. I mean, Pakistan didn't support the resolution that was presented at the General Assembly about invasion on uh, Ukraine. So question is, do you think that Russia um, did not respect the Charter of the United Nations? And why you didn't, why you didn't vote for that resolution? Uh, thank you. First of all, I, I want to express how much we sympathize with the people of Ukraine. It's a devastating, devastating uh, environment over there where the people are uh, experiencing uh, violence and a whole host uh, of consequences. And, and, and what's happening in Ukraine isn't staying in Ukraine. The United States is not going to be able to do it. The United States is going to be able to do it. The United States is going to be able to do it. The United States is going to be एक मरतबा फिर आपको न्यूयॉर्क लिए चलते हैं जहां पर वजीर खारजा बिलावल भुट्टो जरदारी इस वक्त न्यूज कॉन्फ्रेंस कर रहे हैं what India has done August, uh, in August 2019, uh, unilaterally usurping uh, the United Nations, re United Nations recognized internationally disputed territory of Jammu and Kashmir is absolutely condemnable. It is outrageous. I think it was particularly bizarre that I was at the UN Security Council yesterday. The Presidium is with India, the same India who's advocating for reform to multilateralism, but would not allow the UN Security Council resolutions on Kashmir to be implemented. They'll advocate for reform to multilateralism at the United Nations one day. Then they'll advocate for bilateral solutions to Kashmir the next day and ultimately settle for a unilateral usurpation of internationally recognized disputed territory within Kashmir. I think this hypocrisy speaks to the heart of what is wrong here at the United Nations, or the dysfunction here at the United Nations. Surely. No member who refuses to recognize UN's count, UN Security Council resolutions deserves to sit on the UN Security Council. Thank you very much. Thank we will finish one. if Foreign Minister allows for follow-up. Very questions. last one, please. I'm, I'm, I'm late. One, I have a yeah, uh, okay. uh, I'm sure it will. Hopefully, it will be. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Never been before. Uh, uh, well, the, the interior minister presented it uh, to the media verbally. At least we've already uh, passed, uh, shared it with the UN Security Council <coughs> members. I'll find out. If not now, hopefully soon, it'll be available 
to the me uh, to the media. Uh, and as far as tensions between India and Pakistan are concerned, uh, the tension between our two countries uh, have, has reached this point because of the actions of August uh, 2019. Uh, in order for us to address the issue of terrorism, to address my concerns of the issue of terrorism, to address India's concerns of the issue of terrorism, I think it would be appropriate for us to engage productively uh, on this issue in order to do so. Uh, the fragrant violations uh, of international law, of human rights, of everything under the sun on August 2019 must be reviewed. Uh, it, it, the, the Pakistan People's Party, you know, that my mother, Shaheed Mautur Bape and Nazir Bhutto, her entire life advocated for peace with India. Ad consistently advocated for peace and engagement with India. She believed that it was in the benefit of the people of India, in the benefit of the people of Pakistan, for us to live peacefully amongst each other. It was our government in 2010 that for the first time after 1954 unilaterally started trade with India because we knew that we were grabbing onto the third rail of Pakistani politics, taking all the associated political risks, being called traitors and everything else on the streets and the protests of the extremists against us. But we knew that we were doing so in good faith. And we had the reciprocal leadership on the other side who uh, perhaps would be able to uh, take similar brave stances within their own political context. We no longer feel we have those sorts of rational partners on the other side of the border today. We believe that the August 2019 uh, incidences have shut the door, even for political parties such as mine who have long advocated for engagement in peace with India. Uh, we no longer have the domestic political space to do so. After the uh, after that incident. Thank you very much. Uh, my question uh, about price cap was Russian. Yeah, price cap. एक तो अभी तक हम मैं वो ही अभी मजे खारजा बिलावल भुट्टो जरदारी न्यूयॉर्क में न्यूज़ कॉन्फ्रेंस कर रहे थे. हमें दशरथ गर्दी के खिलाफ जंग में अपनी कुर्बानियां नजरअंदाज नहीं होंगी मेरे जी भुट्टो शहीद ने दशरथ गर्दों की धमकियों के बावजूद मेरी वालदा पाकिस्तान की पहली खातून वजीर आजम बेनजीर भुट्टो को दहशत गर्दों ने शहीद कर दिया वजीर खारजा बिलावल भुट्टो जरदारी न्यूयॉर्क में प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंस कर रहे हैं कर सकते हैं किसी मुस्तबिल में ऐसा निजाम पैदा हो मगर जल्दी ऐसे इम्कान नहीं है एंड एज फार एज डिस्काउंटेड रेट्स नो वन इज Giving discounted rates for all the oil these days—that's that's just not—that's uh, not a reality. It is true that we are actively uh, pursuing ways and means to address uh, the energy shortfalls and difficulties we're facing um, in Pakistan. After the conflict in Ukraine and with Russia, Europe relied on oil from Russia, not Pakistan. Europe re re relied on gas from Russia, not Pakistan. The places that we relied from. Uh, where we used to buy our, 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 our resources from, now the Europeans and the Western world are going to them and crowding out that market for us. So it's an incredibly uh, difficult situation, and I, I believe we must engage in whatever way we can to meet the needs of our people. But uh, the concept of uh, discounted uh, Russian oil uh, is a truck uh, वजी खारजा बिलावल भुट्टो जरदारी न्यूयॉर्क में न्यूज कॉन्फ्रेंस कर रहे हैं उनका कहना था कि इंसदाती दहशत गर्दों की माली मामला टूटने के लिए फेटअप ने हमारे इकदाम की 